Hey boys and girls, welcome back to Monroe Live. I'm here with Tom Prucha and we're gonna today talk a little bit about batteries. Okay, so you'll notice that I don't have gloves on because we use them all up. And the last pair is, uh, <clears throat> is on Tom here. And Tom will be doing all the picking up. Now, for those of you who really know about batteries, you'll know that there's dust associated with these things that's probably not the best thing in the world to suck into your lungs. Um, that there's and the vapors. That and the vapors. Well, the vapors are gone. We don't have to worry too much about that. But now we've got dried chemicals that uh, we're not going to be really excited about uh, swallowing or breathing. So what we have is a lot of noisemaker over here. This is our ventilation system. So uh, we have a cross breeze going in here. We've got it outside of the bags so you can see what's going on, but that's about it. We're not gonna be, uh, we're not gonna be uh, fondling these things too much. And as soon as this is over, they go back in their little plastic bags and uh, they go back into their box. So in, in short translation, please don't try this at home. Yeah, don't, <laughs> don't try this at home. This is not, uh, this is not for the, uh, this is not for the faint of heart, number one, and definitely not for amateurs. So anyways, um, uh, Dr. Tom here is going to tell us a little bit about <clears throat> um, what these different things are. That's how we're gonna start off. People wanna know what's anode, what's cathodes, what's collectors, on and on. And Tom's gonna give you a quick um, explanation on that, and then we're gonna go in to show you the differences between the old 4680 battery and the new one. This episode of Monroe Live is sponsored by T-Raps. T-Raps makes premium aftermarket accessories for electric vehicles at affordable prices. Designed and manufactured in the USA, T-Raps can help you organize, protect, and stylize your Ford, Rivian, Lucid, or Tesla EV. T-Raps is now offering Cybertruck accessories. We got our hands on a few of their products to deck out Sandy's truck and he couldn't be happier. All of their storage organizers are meticulously crafted to fit perfectly into the truck and blend seamlessly with its sleek aesthetic. There are several varieties available to keep every area of your Cybertruck tidy. With these vinyl wraps, you can defend your pillars and door buttons against scratches. They are expertly cut for perfect precision and are available in two finishes. For even more layers of protection, T-Wraps also offers screen protectors and mud flaps. Their screen protectors are available in a matte or clear coating and will protect both your front and rear screens from fingerprints and impacts. Their mud flaps are easy to install and are made from durable plastic that will shield your Cybertruck against mud or debris on all of your adventures. Get your own EV accessories at TWraps.com and use code MONROE to get 10% off your order. Thanks to TWraps for sponsoring today's video. Now, let's get back to the show. So let's start with some of the fundamentals here. You know, first and foremost, we've extracted some cells um, from the Cybertruck battery. And as anyone who watches the channel knows, we did the uh, 2022 Model Y structural pack uh, a little over a year ago. And I have one of the cells from that pack here as a show and tell item. You can see that it's still got some of its uh, characteristic pink foam in place, what we like to call the pink foam of death, because it's still gives us fond memories. Um, no, it doesn't. It gives us <laughs> nightmares. <laughs> definitely not fond. And here's one from the Cybertruck. And one thing I should note about the one from the Cybertruck is that this would be unique, I think, in the business right now in that this one actually is still charged. So that being the case, yes, we found a way to extract live cells. And it is a exciting process. And we now know how to do it. But we well, also, actually, you know, while we're talking about this, um, you'll notice that, yes, this is still live, but this is not one that we're going to do complete testing on. And the reason for that is because it slightly leaked. It's slightly. got a little dent in the bottom, too, yeah. from, from the extraction process. The yeah. others we've extracted haven't got that dent, but we have others that are right. in line for electrical testing, as everyone is hoping to hear the results of. Yes, and the reason that we don't have um, a whole bunch of ones that have the little ball bearings gone is because I value my customers, um, well, I value my customers too, but I value our people here at Monroe. So with that as, uh, as a starting point. So 
Yes, the, um, the fundamental differences are pretty clear between the first generation 4680 and the second generation. Uh, you can't really tell very much from the top, but from the bottom, it's a very obvious difference. You can see this has got a little pop rivet device. This has a ball bearing underneath this uh, material if you scrape it away. But that serves as the primary vent function, if you will. Uh, internally, there's some additional components in this one in that there is a, uh, a copper tab at the bottom that collects everything together and makes the electrical connection to the can. They've eliminated that in the Gen 2 version in favor of these little welds that you see here instead. We did notice that uh, in the cells that we have, there is both the nine weld version like this one, two here, one there, three of each type. There is another type of cell that's about evenly mixed within the battery that has 12 welds per cell. So it's just three additional welds. Uh, we don't want to call that a difference. It may you be a running change. And this kind of shows you up close what that is. So those welds are going through the end cap. There's your ball bearing at the center. And the uh, foils from the anode are directly welded to this cap. Whereas there's an intermediate device on the Gen 1 that handles that functionality. So that's a, a, a reduction in components, a reduction in cost and it made more space in the cell that gave them the ability to increase their energy density, which our tests should hopefully confirm. Uh, Tesla has come out and made some declarations about the uh, improvement they've made in energy density, so we applaud that and we look forward to confirming it for them and telling you what the numbers are as we test it. So that said, what's on the inside? Um, you saw the end cap. The top half, the, the upper side of the cell, what we call the cathode, still has this sort of plate that brings all of the um, flower tabs together from the jelly roll okay, on so the anode side. Why don't we, okay, good, anode right, so side. So I'm just yeah. saying that that part gets welded to this, and then this part gets attached to the center electrode that is the positive tab of the cell. So let's talk about these jelly rolls. There are two, all right, Every lithium-ion battery has five basic components. It has an anode, it has a cathode, it has a separator, it has an electrolyte, and it has an enclosure. So we've seen the enclosure. That's not anything to really get too excited about. Um, but the jelly rolls are very similar in appearance between the Gen 1 and Gen 2, but we know through our analysis that the cathode side is significantly different. Um, they've all but eliminated the cobalt from this part of the jelly roll, and um, what's left is a very small amount of cobalt and mostly nickel. So it's still on an, an aluminum foil. We are talking about the energetic materials that are applied to the aluminum foil. Um, on the cathode side, we haven't really di done a deep dive there, but we know that in the Gen 1 they used a lot of synthetic graphite. So we're expecting more of the same here. And again, this is the so-called flower tab arrangement that makes the 4680 somewhat unique in the business because instead of having one tab that brings all the current through one little um, very narrow opening that gets hot, we have a very wide opening that is conducive to uh, lots of power and um, you know, numerous connections that used to be much smaller in the smaller cells we've always dealt with in the past. So. There's a separator that is um, necessary between the cathode and the anode because if they touch each other, there's a short circuit and bad things will happen. So this has a very important job of allowing the ions to pass through it using the electrolyte as a carrier, uh, but it also serves this important purpose of keeping the two separate from one another so they don't short circuit and cause calamity. So not really a lot to be excited about with the separator. Um, it looks very similar to the other one. We will be doing some analysis to prove that for certain. Um, but beyond that, the electrolyte is uh, uh, something interesting. We've had a chance to take a look at that. We haven't had a chance to analyze it yet. Uh, maybe some differences there, we're not sure. So that said, um, the positive terminal, what is the cathode, looks almost identical. In fact, they have the same sort of dime-shaped tab at the very top. There's a, a rubberized gasket underneath it, and they look very similar to one another. But I will tell you that the one on the Cybertruck appears to be more frail just by casual observation. So that said, we are you know, frustrated in taking out 
cells and getting them so that they're leak-free, dent-free, and suitable for electrical tests. But since we've done it, we know how to do it, we'll do more of it. So that's the fundamentals. You charge the lithium-ion battery uh, by placing the, um, the ions, as they were, um, into the anode where the graphite collects it. And then upon discharge, those ions move back across from the anode back to the cathode, and that's where it delivers discharge current. So um, charging collects in the anode, discharging, it moves away from the anode, goes back to the cathode, and it, it continues to go back and forth through the charge-discharge cycle life of the cell. So that said, um, we know with some certainty that the anode has more silicon. Um, we didn't find any silicon in the Gen 1 cell, but we did find some in this one. So we're hesitant to give you an exact number, but suffice to say, they did get some silicon in the anode, and there should very well be an increase in energy density from that change alone. We believe there's other differences that will facilitate incremental increases in energy density as well. But with some certainty here, we at least have seen the silicon that they've said that they would have, and here it is. So with that... Um, well, there's, there's one other thing that I think we should toss out there. Um, uh, word has it that normally there are three components that you look at inside of a, inside of a battery for metals. Nickel is the big one, and then there's magnesia, manganese, manganese. manganese and, um, and then the last one is cobalt. Cobalt's used primarily to inhibit fires. Um, these batteries appear to be a little different in that there's nickel and there's cobalt, but no manganese. manganese. So we speculate that this has got something to do with the dry electrode process. Manganese as a material isn't generally as in short supply as some of the other materials we worry more about. So it's interesting that they eliminated it. So they had to have a process reason for doing so because it was probably not cost or performance driven. Um, but certainly one of the big things they were trying to achieve is the dry electrode process on both the cathode and the anode. And as you may recall, they only achieved it on one side in the last uh, cell design. So whatever the magic is that's allowed for them to do that, and we have high confidence we will find it to be a dry process for both this time. However that worked, uh, it looks like eliminating the manganese helped with that somehow. This end cap is a unique piece, and it's kind of oh, hard to see, it's but it's got a metal reinforcement around the perimeter. So there's these little pop rivet looking devices here that attach the can to that reinforcing ring. But what we know from one of our competitors' videos is that when the vent lets loose, uh, this ball comes out as a norm, and that would be a projectile with the pressure that it would take to push that out of there. So you don't want to be in the way of that thing. Um, and if that doesn't work, like a lot of other cells we've seen, particularly in the prismatics where they have a designated vent function, it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes the pressure profile is such that you don't get the designated vent to let loose and something else lets loose instead. And we know that in the case of this cell, when that happens, that it breaks this uh, perforation around the perimeter. You can hardly see it, but there it is where my thumb line is. It's sort of triangular in shape. But that whole piece pops out when the pressure profile is right. And it's, you could call it a secondary vent function, uh, primary vent, uh, secondary vent, a, uh, a little vent and a big one, however you want to word it. But it does appear to have two intended vent functions. And they're both at the bottom, which is where we would have predicted them to be, given the fact that they allocated all that space at the bottom of the pack, as you see in the background there, to evacuate those gases from the battery pack when such an event occurs. So that was the last thing. And now we're done. <laughs> okay, thanks for watching. Thanks. Stay tuned to Monroe Live. Bye.